Good evening, welcome everybody. Just give everyone a chance to join. Mm -hmm. It's always a good sign when you can see people, numbers going up and people joining, you know that the right links have made it out to the right places. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is great. <laughs> I'm just letting a few That is fine, <laughs> job well done, okay. Yes, <laughs> always, always a sigh of relief that the technology is working. Oh, that was supposed to not be a comma. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, good evening everyone that's uh, logging on so far. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. Um, I've got here um, two great men from across the pond, from the John Hopkins um, Lyme Disease Research Center. We've got John Orcott. Am I pronouncing that right, John? I've realized I've always been, you've been using your, uh, your yeah. first name. <laughs> Thank you. And Mark Soloski. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to get them to introduce themselves to you um, in a moment, but just whilst people are on. So tonight's um, event is to discuss some of the really interesting research that these guys have been doing um, over the past year or so many years um, to just kind of delve into it a little bit deeper, get them to take us through that and almost give, a, give an explanation that, uh, that the kind of everyday person can understand about the, the progress that they've been making and about what that might mean in real terms for Lyme disease um, patients, you know, both in the US and, and hopefully across the globe. Mm -hmm. um, so, <clears throat> so yeah, I don't know if you guys would like to start um, giving yourselves an intro. So perhaps John, as you're on my top, left if you'd like to go first. Yeah, <clears throat> so thanks for inviting us. Um, I'm an infectious disease trained doctor and I got involved in Lyme disease when I started seeing patients. I'm in Maryland. Uh, Mark and I are at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. And I started seeing patients and after all my training in infectious diseases, I realized that what I was seeing wasn't exactly what I had learned in the textbooks, that the real life Lyme disease didn't fit the map of the textbooks. And I started becoming very interested in, in what was going on and realizing there was very little research to understand what was actually happening in my patients with um, chronic persistent symptoms. So I got involved in research and the, the whole goal of our research is to kind of bridge patients and what's happening to them to the best in science. So we're what's called a translational research group. We try to translate the patient's illness and translate that into the basic science lab to understand and we focus on several things. Um, one is um, we have a large biorepository of samples that we use to develop better diagnostic tests. We also are looking at biomarkers that can be used for future treatment trials and all these things that kind of connect our patient's experience because I'm an MD, I see patients and how we can connect that to the researchers like Mark and I'll let Mark introduce himself. Hi. Greetings all, uh, I'm Mark Soloski and uh, uh, you know, uh, like John, I'm at Johns Hopkins, and I am an immunologist. I have, by training, um, you know, have uh, studied how the immune system works, how the immune system uh, responds to infection, and I got very interested um, in the last oh, decade or more, actually, in how the immune system to infectious agents can trigger long-term chronic persistent symptoms in folks. And I uh, got involved in Lyme disease research because my wife is one of those folks who had persistent symptoms, has persistent symptoms, uh, you know, linked to, uh, to Lyme disease. And uh, when I was, we were searching out folks to, uh, to see her, somebody said, well, go see John Alcott. He, he knows a lot about this. And so, so my wife got to see him and then I got to know John. And then we started a conversation about 12 years ago, uh, and we've been working on this ever since. Uh, so I'm a basic immunologist. I think the immune system is the basis of just about everything that happens uh, in, in us. I'm, I'm very biased in, in that, so I'll let, let it be known. And, uh, but the immune system, the immune process, how we respond to things, um, at, you know, I think drive a lot of, of, of the uh, symptoms and how we feel. Um, and so uh, our goal uh, is to understand uh, uh, the mechanisms that are underlying uh, folks who 
have persistent uh, uh, symptomology, chronic symptomology. You know, those are the people we want to help. Those are the ones we need to help. Uh, you know, we know that people who are diagnosed with Lyme disease and get properly treated with Lyme disease, about half of them or more, a little bit more than half will get just fine and return to health. But there's another um, uh, group that have these uh, persistent symptoms. And those are the folks that we're trying to understand. Thank, thanks so much for that intro, guys. So I guess really, Mark, for you, it's it's a it's a, an area of interest, but also quite a personal um, cause for you then if your wife, you know, has, has experienced those persistent symptoms as well. Um, and, and as well for you, John, you know, if you're seeing patients every day, you, you get to see the kind of the, the emotional and the physical side of, you know, persistent symptoms with Lyme disease and, you know, what you know, the kind of many aspects of someone's life that it can, you know, it can um, affect. And I realise I didn't introduce myself. Um, for those of you who haven't joined an event before or you haven't met me, I'm Rosie. I'm the charity manager here at Cordwell Lyme Co. So delving into some of the research that you guys have done recently um, and that you spoke about in your recent newsletter, um, you know, so you can, uh, you know, tell us a little bit more about that. So starting with the uh, work you've been doing on immune dysfunction, um, so you've been doing some in vitro research using human um, immune cells, haven't you? And looking at how um, the infection might induce kind of autoimmune illness, is that right? Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Um, I don't know if that's one for Mark, maybe. Sure, I, I can start off and then, you know, John and I are a bit of a tag team. So, you know, we, I should remind you, I'm not a physician. So, so I, uh, as I tell people, I know just enough to be dangerous. So, uh, <laughs> but, you know, we started out um, trying to examine um, uh, some immune markers that are present in an easily accessible source in our patients, namely their blood. And we measured um, a, a number of different, you know, we call them immunologically uh, relevant molecules. Uh, we call them cytokines, chemokines, lymphokines, monokines. There's all kinds of different kinds of those kinds, so to speak. And so we measured uh, about 60 or 70 of them in the blood at the same time. That's a big undertaking we did with a colleague at Stanford. And what we noticed was that, you know, when people came in and John diagnosed them, they had huge quantities of many different cytokines in their blood. And, but the thing is, is that that was kind of the same kind of signature, if you will, that somebody who had flu. So there really wasn't anything that was telling us that was different. But, and we noticed that um, after they were treated with antibiotics and they came back and we took another sample that most of those molecules went down to normal levels, just like healthy controls from the middle Atlantic in the United States, except for one. <laughs> and one of, and it, it's a, it's got a, it's a, called CCL19. And that was kind of a cool marker because not only was it, did it stay up in some people, the people it stayed up in were the people who had persistent symptoms that met our definition of, you know, post-treatment Lyme disease, we call it. So that suggested that, you know, and at least one explanation is that there is an immune process that started out that never quite got turned off, that's still simmering, you know? And so that was sort of one of our clues that, gee, maybe the immune response is sort of not normal here or not being regulated properly. Because in most people, you know, your immune response goes up and then it drops back down again. You know, that's pretty typical. Uh, and so, um, uh, so that was our, one of our first clues. And uh, so the, this particular molecule is interesting because of where it's produced. Now, it can be produced um, in tissues that are undergoing um, chronic inflammation, where chronic immune response is going on, where immune response shouldn't be going on. So it's known to be elevated in these diseases like Sjogren's, where people have inflammation of the salivary glands, you know, uh, and other kinds of diseases. So now we don't have any information as to exactly where um, the inflammation is occurring because we just don't, you know, uh, we just don't know. But um, 
you know, we teamed up with some very smart uh, people who can take pictures of people, <laughs> imaging. Uh, and so we did what we call PET imaging. And so we were able to talk some of John's patients uh, to do PET imaging. And the PET imaging we used would measure whether or not there was a, an immune process going on in the brain. Because we said, you know, a lot of the symptoms are centered in different regions of the brain. My wife's a neuroscientist, so she tells me that all the time. And so we learn from each other. Uh, so did that, and lo and behold, you know, these patients had, you know, showed that they had inflammation going on in different regions of the brain. It seemed to be all over, but it was concentrated in certain areas. And it was consistent with a certain type of cell called a microglial cell being activated. So microglia are, are immune cells in the brain. They are important components of our brain. They help actually regulate neuronal connections uh, in the brain. Uh, they're, they're an amazing cell um, that do lots of new things that we never imagined them doing. So it may be that there is some kind of an immune process that's being triggered. So I'll stop here and let my colleague John chime in. So this, this is the first example of um, our translational research approach. You know, patients often say that, you know, I feel ill and we know they feel ill and that there are severe symptoms, but this is an example of attaching biology to that. So no longer can we, you know, stand for it when patients are told that it's all in their head, that there's nothing right. wrong with them, which mm -hmm. we hear a lot. This is an example of connecting that to a real biology. Now we've got evidence in the laboratory from actual patients that there's something going on, that their illness isn't just something they're making up, that there's a biologic basis for why they still have active inflammation and still are ill. So mm -hmm. that's what I love about this translational component of our research is that, you know, there is something going on. There's numerous other examples in our research where every time we look, there's a real biology underlying why the patients has stayed ill. Mm -hmm. So it, it's fine. Being able to find that immune cell response can give you the evidence that, that the ongoing symptoms, even if they haven't been pinpointed, are down to a genuine, you know, physical immune response within the body rather than, like you say, mm -hmm. in someone's head. And, and what, what type of um, ongoing symptoms might, might this include? You know, how might that manifest itself? Right. So the, you know, so the symptoms are pretty typical and, and um, re well recognized. The, the classic tri trio is fatigue, musculoskeletal pain, and what patients describe as brain fog or cognitive symptoms. There's many others as well, but that three stand at the center. And it's a, it's a trio that is found throughout medical illness. It's, it's not unique to, to Lyme disease. You see it in a lot of infections. You see it in chronic ME, CS, you know, chronic fatigue, mm -hmm. fibromyalgia. It's now being described and we'll discuss later the COVID long haulers. But it's that trio that seems to recur in human medicine of fatigue, cognitive complaints, and musculoskeletal pain. And then with this mm -hmm. with the Lyme patients, also a host of other symptoms that um, really relate to all different body symptoms. But yeah, it's really interesting. And, and have you yet been able to find a way of understanding whether this immune response is indicative of an ongoing infection or whether it refers to a separate autoimmune condition? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question, you know, and, and, you know, I have to say we don't completely understand. There's evidence for all of those things you just mentioned. Um, there is a uh, Borrelia burgdorferi, the causative agent of Lyme disease, is a tricky bacteria. Mm -hmm. Okay, we know in the laboratory that we we and this isn't work that we've done. This is colleagues of ours have done. But if you expose Borrelia, and you can grow it in the laboratory, uh, and you can expose it to antibiotics. And what happens is the the you know the cells can grow to a certain stage. And they suddenly, they don't care that the antibiotic is, is around. They actually go into a new state they call persister state. And um, they're alive. Uh, <laughs> and they completely change their shape and the genes they express and the proteins that are present. Um, 
And, and this isn't unheard of either, you know, tuberculosis bacteria does a very similar thing. So in the laboratory, we have data that, you know, it can form these quote persister forms that can last for very long periods of time. Now, whether that occurs uh, in, in the human remains to be seen. There is good evidence in animal models though, that this does occur. And animal models as close to um, a human as uh, primates, the rhesus macaque. Um, uh, our colleague Monica Embers has shown that that uh, you know the bacteria can persist even in the face of a robust antibiotic treatment. So that could explain some people. It may not explain everybody. And how to approach that is really tricky. Mm. And that's one of our challenges. Yeah. Okay, um, well, thanks for covering that um, That one, guys. We'll move on to um, the second area, which is a really, really kind of popular one. And um, I, I don't think I mentioned at the beginning um, the people that are tuned in. If you do have any questions um, about what we're discussing, about research, um, then please do feel free to use them either um, pop them in the chat function or the Q&A function and we'll pick them pick them up at the end. Um, but moving on to the second thing that you mentioned in, in the newsletter and like I say a kind of hot topic often um, among Lyme disease was studies that you've been doing into the gut microbiome. Mm. So you've been making discoveries around a distinct microbiome signature that's discovered in Lyme disease patients and how this might represent a potential new avenue for di um, for new diagnostics and, and treatment. Yeah. So how is the microbiome signature distinct in Lyme patients? What, what have you guys been finding? Well, um, let me do this one, John. Yeah, you start and I'll... Okay, I'll start, you can finish. Okay, so uh, we work with a colleague up in Boston at Northeastern University, Kim Lewis, and another um, colleague at UCSD who are experts in microbiome and weird bacteria. Okay. And uh, we examined the fecal microbiome from over 60 of our, of our patients with persistent Lyme disease. Now, that's not acute disease. That's very different. That's a study where um, there are folks who, as John was fond of saying, who've come to see him at chapter 12 in their story, you know, and we have to figure out what chapter one is. So these are people who have persistent symptoms for different lengths of time, from six months to maybe even eight to 10 years. Okay. Those are the kind of the extremes. Um, and we looked at their fecal microbiome uh, using, you know, very sophisticated molecular approaches. And we found that there was a unique microbiome signature um, that uh, was associated with some of the patients with PTLDS. Uh, and the signature was a high level of, of a unusual bacterial species called Blaudia and low levels of a bacteria that we know a little a lot more about called um, uh, Bacteroides. Uh, and, and so it was high Blaudia, low Bacteroides. And so that was, and that held up. I mean, we first tested one group and then we saw this and then we retested on an independent group and we saw the same thing. So we're pretty confident of this result. And as far as we know, there's not really been this kind of shift in other kind of patient types. Although, you know, we're still learning more and more and more. We're at our infancy, really, of understanding the microbiome and how it impacts health and disease. What's interesting is uh, Bacteroides is unusual bacteria because it produces a small molecule called GABA, okay? GABA binds to GABA receptors and influences our mood. And so it could be that levels of, of this bacteria can impact how you feel, okay? And maybe a contributor to it. So, um, you know, and maybe, just maybe, you know, uh, altering the microbiome in some individuals may, may, may help them. So, John? So I'm, I'm gonna share my screen now, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, uh, yeah a figure that may help us kind of talk about this a little bit, which, uh, so can you all see that? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, a lot of what we've been talking about, we're starting to see how things may be connected. 
And, you know, Rosie, you already asked the question, you know, is how is the potential for persistent infection connected to driving the immune responses? And now we've also said, well, you know, there's this potential microbiome gut impact, which Mark can tell us more about how that also impacts the immune system. And then we've also touched a little bit about the neural network with the PET imaging. So what the theme that we're going to hit today is that these things are probably all connected and that maybe each patient's a little different as well. And so in some patients, the persistence of Borrelia, either infection or antigens may be driving the immune response, or other people it may be driven by autoimmunity or the gut microbiome. In some patients, it may be driven by persistent changes in their neural networks. And that all of these things are viable and they're not mutually exclusive hypotheses. So that's one of the themes we wanna get across today. And, and then each of the aspects of the research here will show, I think, that that how these individual areas are so important, but probably all, all connected as well. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, in the, in, and I'm gonna go ahead and quit sharing now. So in, in the gut microbiome area, you know, it's also an area that has practical implications for our patients, right? Because what we eat obviously impacts our gut microbiome. And so when you talk about people's diet, and, um, and, and medicines that they're taking, those have real practical implications here. And so we also focus with our patients a lot on how they can help promote a healthy microbiome, you know, through the use of um, fermented food products, avoiding refined foods, probiotics, things like that that are actually practical, simple steps that they can take mm -hmm. that have the implications that, you know, while it's not proven yet, that there's some implications that changing the microbiome could promote health, could impact positively the immune system. Because again, mm -hmm. all of these things are connected, so. Thanks, John. I think um, a few people were struggling to see the, the image as, as it wasn't full screen, but perhaps, um, John, if you, you're happy to share it with me, I can send it in the follow-up email to everybody when I send the recording. Sure. If that's okay, thank you. Yeah. So yeah. if any, anyone kind of saw it but couldn't mm -hmm. see it in detail, you will be able to, to see that. Yeah. So just going back to, to that then, so, is that this kind of signature microbiome, this microbiome signature that, that Lyme uh, sufferers have, is that why some Lyme patients experience gut issues or can that signature be present even if they don't, if that isn't kind of one of their key persistent symptoms? You broke up a little bit in the beginning of that question. So. Oh, sorry, I'll just repeat. So I was saying, is, is the... Um, is this part a uh, part of a reason why Lyme patients have gut issues, um, or is it possible to have that microbiome signature and not not particularly experience? Um, why don't I take that, Mark? Okay. Okay. Go ahead. So um, I think um, again, there's all, there's going to be multiple mechanisms. So I think the gut issues in our patients um, often also relate to other things. Some people have undiagnosed food intolerances like dairy or gluten food intolerances. Um, and so there's, we, we have to investigate all the possibilities. The blaudia in the microbiome isn't one that's been associated with a specific like diarrheal gut issue like C. diff colitis is a specific bacteria. Clostridium difficile is a specific bacteria yeah. that does cause diarrhea. I don't think the blouty has had that connection for overt GI symptoms, but we don't know. And so I would say possibly, and it's also pro possible to have the microbiome impact on your general health without actually having gut issues, right? Mm -hmm. If it, what Mark's explaining, you know, uh, you know, you don't have to have diarrhea or gut issues to have that microbiome impact. Um, on the other aspects of your health. Um, so, you know, kind of in summary though, I think for gut issues, there's multiple causes and your, your physician really would want to examine also other food intolerances and, you know, bacterial overgrowth syndromes mm -hmm. and things like C. diff colitis. So yeah. the lot, lots of potential things that need to be looked into. Okay. You now your microbiome and your immune system and, and your central nervous system, uh, you know, they are talking to each other in ways that we're just beginning to understand. This whole thing where Bacteroides was making a small molecule called Kappa, you know, was a mind blower. It was a mind blower. 
you know, what is this bacteria doing making this thing? You know, this is not something that we think bacteria make, we make it. Uh, uh, and it did, it made the exact same molecule and the levels of that bacteria, you know, correlated with how people felt. And so it, this may be a real thing to think about in, in Lyme disease. So altering that. Now we don't know. Uh, the immune system actually is structured in our gut in such a way that it's constantly putting out projections into the lumen of our GI tract and interrogating what's out there. Um, it's, it's really fascinating. And we're getting some, in, in animal models, we have some beautiful images of sort of how that's happening, you know, the dynamics of it, you know, where it just keeps putting out these little cytoplasmic projections and to, to sense what's going by and how it should respond. And it actually has receptors on it that says, ooh, this is bad, you know, or this is good, you know, and they respond accordingly. And we know that we, in the laboratory, they can generate mice that have no gut microbiome. Their immune systems are totally messed up. <laughs> they don't develop normal, they don't respond normally. So in that extreme example, which doesn't occur in our human real world, um, uh, you know, it, it's proof that the two of them talking to talk to each other. And, you know, we're still unlocking the secrets of how that happens and how that varies from individual to individual. Mm. You know, it's one thing to have an inbred mouse strain. It's another thing to have, you know, <laughs> outbred humans. Definitely. We're complicated creatures. And, um, you know, you mentioned the newsletter that, that some of these discoveries might work towards um, new avenues for diagnostics and treatment. How so? I mean, I know, John, you mentioned that, that there, are, there are simple things you can do around kind of diet and what have you, but how, how might some of these discoveries work towards changing diagnostics and treatment for Lyme? So um, the, the real elusive thing in Lyme disease is a lack of effective biomarkers to both diagnose persistent illness and to target the therapy. So, um, so for instance, if, if there's an over exuberant immune response that you see in an autoimmune disorder, you and you can demonstrate that, you might target the therapy to work on the immune system. If on the other hand, there's evidence of persistent bacterial antigens, which there's most evidence is in animal models, but there is some evidence in humans now about persistence of um, Borrelia bacterial cell wall components, those antigens, if those are what are driving the inflammation, then maybe you target the therapy at the microorganism instead. So it, it, it's a two-part thing. One is figuring out what to target, and then, then we have tools to target it. Um, depend, mm -hmm. But they're very different tools if it's primarily a microbial bacterial problem versus a over exuberant immune response problem or a microbiome uh, problem. And I think it will turn out to be heterogeneous. I think patients, again, as Mark's hinting, are, are heterogeneous. And so, and we know Lyme disease is a complex illness. So I think some people, when we get better diagnostics, will sort out into different groups and then that will drive the most appropriate therapy for the, that group. Mm -hmm. So kind of understanding their, their kind of key persistent symptoms and therefore where might need to be targeted for treatment. Is that, is that what you mean? Yeah, what's driving them. Um, yeah. It, it, yeah. You know, it's just like in the old days, you know, we used to say somebody has cancer. Now we would never just stop, right? We would say they have this kind of cancer or that kind of cancer. And they all have different therapies, even though they're all cancer. We envision the day someday when you won't just say chronic Lyme disease, you'll say this is a person with chronic Lyme disease with persistent Borrelia and they need this treatment. Or this is a person with chronic Lyme disease with chronic immunologic dysfunction and they need this kind of therapy. That you know, mm -hmm. the, the subgroups, you know, it's an extension of what's called personalized medicine, that patients aren't all the same and they, they shouldn't, they can't be treated all the same. Right. Yeah, yeah, I think I think those listening would really appreciate that comment actually. Yeah. Yeah, everybody is unique, and you know we're as 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 therapies evolve, and in the in the world of immunotherapeutics, you know, people are developing new ways to tweak the immune system, both dial it back if they have to, or dial it up if they need to. You know, so th those things are happening. Dialing it up in the case of of say cancer, 
you know, with cancer immunotherapies. They're waking up the immune system to attack the tumor. And in autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and et cetera, they're using uh, agents, uh, you know, natural agents, uh, immunobiologicals to, to dial it down. So, and, you know, we we'll hopefully will have much more surgical um, instruments and, and therapeutics uh, down the road. Interesting. So moving on to the next um, uh, section was um, your, your research around the metabolic response. Can you mm. tell us a little bit more about that work and what, what the findings show us? Mark? Sure. Now, you know, maybe we'll start off by just saying what is the metabolome? You know, and, you know, we're all metabolized, you know, we're, we're obsessed with generating ATP, you know, we need to do that because, you know, that's our big energy producing molecule. And we have many different ways of doing that, you know, uh, and we, you know, words that maybe are, you know, uh, it'll bring back some bad biology courses you take in biochemistry courses like the TCA cycle or anaerobic glycolysis and all those things. Well, our cells are doing those things, you know, right now. And, and, uh, and when they do them, they give off very small molecules, you know, um, and that can be measured in the blood because our blood is constantly um, in equilibrium with what's going on in our tissues. And so we entered into, uh, we worked with uh, a colleague at Colorado State, you know, buried in the snow, uh, and they uh, measured uh, a number of different small molecules, metabolites, uh, in uh, the serum of our patients. And what stood out was that there was, there is a signature for people who have acute disease, okay? And uh, there is a signature of people who return to health. So, you know, they have this signature and then this signature goes away. But then there was another signature that stayed up in patients with persistent symptoms. And we saw this not only in our group, but there was another group uh, that was collected in New York State um, and a little bit further north of us uh, at, showed a very similar overlapping signature. So it's as if this is, that's really, you know, uh, you know, uh, something you say yay about because, you know, this isn't, you know, when you have those groups of patients kind of responding the same way, uh, you know, you know, you're kind of onto something. Now, how do we alter our metabolism? You know, metabolism re responds to so many different things. Uh, our level uh, by, by which we move and exercise, uh, it changes, um, you know, uh, how we respond to stress you know, uh, whether, you know, how we respond to uh, so many different things like sleep, um, et cetera. And I don't think we really understand how to manipulate it, <laughs> you know, how to, how to change it. You know, it's just you know, a, uh, it's a signature. Um, and now we have to figure out what that signature is telling us. You know, does it mean that we have to maybe change nutritional things or supplement things? You know, uh, it, it may mean those things, but we just don't know. And many of the really small molecules, they are blips on a computer or on an instrument. We don't know exactly what they are. <laughs> so that's a whole nother thing, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, so, so it's you like you've things, identified but... a, a, a planet in a, in a system far, far away, but now you got to nail down and say, okay, is that a green planet? Or is that a, you know, what kind of, a, what it is? And so that's a, that's the next level. And we're working with the same group to try to understand um, uh, whether this same signature is present in our patients who are, who exhibit PTLDS, you know, our quote cross-sectional um, study. So, John? Yeah, I, I'll add Mark Ray's issue. I think that it's really important to reemphasize. Um, so even though we're not exactly sure the mechanisms, I, as a clinician, I'll tell you, it's, it's abundantly clear. And there's mm -hmm. some biologic basis for this, that, you know, stress and mind is directly impactful on these issues. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we used to talk about a mind-body connection. I mean, I don't look at it as a connection. I look at it as a continuum. I mean, your mind is obviously connected to your immune system. It, what you think impacts your immune system. Stress levels impact your immune system and your metabolism. So I think it's clear 
from our clinical work and now the biology again supports that, that, that mind, stress, sleep kind of access is so important to health. And so, um, and, and this is also a good area to, for people to get help because it doesn't necessarily just depend on a pill or something, right? It can it can be impacted dramatically through um, our own, you know, I, I liken, you know, mindfulness sort of like physical therapy for your brain, right? Mm -hmm. So if you broke your arm, you do physical therapy to get your arm strength back. And I think our patients need, you know, activity, but they also need mental physical therapy for their mind because those neural networks and connections um, also have suffered from the illness and need to be rebuilt as part of recovery. And that directly is connected to the immune system, to the metabolism, all these things. So we're huge proponents of having, while we're, you know, I'm a pill doctor primarily, right? I prescribe things, but at the same time, I prescribe my patients also, you know, get get their, their therapy for their brains through mindfulness, yoga, things like that, because those have a huge impact on the, they're connected to everything we're talking about today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. And um, I know we wanted to touch uh, just briefly on the kind of links between uh, you know, late stage Lyme and long COVID. Yeah. What, what kind of observations would you guys like to make on that front? Oh, John, you just, uh, you know, wrote a nice letter in Lancet, don't you? Yeah, I think you mentioned that, that actually. In okay. The, in the Some uh, science, yeah. Hmm. So when long COVID came out, you know, we, we compared the symptoms that you were asking me about in the beginning. We call them butterfly graphs. They have all the symptoms kind of the longer the wing is, the more prominent the symptoms are. So real prominent ones have a big wing and then they narrow down and they kind of look like one wing of a butterfly. And when you compare the left wing of the butterfly of the Lyme long hauler patients to the right wing of the COVID long hauler patients, it looks like a perfect symmetric butterfly. I mean, the, the symptoms are almost identical with the exception of the long hauler COVIDs have a little, have more respiratory symptoms because it's a respiratory virus. But if you pull that out, they're almost identical. So there's this common theme again, is there's these infections and, and their long hauler phenomenons are driving a very similar set of symptoms and, and they're very stereotypical. <clears throat> but we learn from this. And so in the long hauler situation, it, uh, some of the early evidence is it's a lot of these symptoms are being driven by alterations in the autonomic nervous system. Mm -hmm. And this was a theme that was, we've learned from another similar illness, um, ME, um, CSF, you know, chronic fatigue syndrome. And so in there, there's this thought that, you know, autonomic dysfunction drives the fatigue in chronic fatigue syndrome through changes in blood pressure and autonomic function that have, again, a real biology that affect brain function uh -oh. through the autonomic control of pulse and heart froze. rate and blood pressure. And that's been hypothesized in chronic fatigue syndrome, mm. but it, again, it's being seen as a prominent hypothesis in the COVID. Oh, Jeff, you're frozen. Uh, sorry if anyone's yes sorry if anyone uh, if, if we've had a bit of a pause there I'm not sure hopefully they'll be back with us ah here we go that cut out for a second there. yeah sorry I don't know what happened there I, I seem to still be on here but um John you, you kind of paused first and then I lost you both so hopefully everyone's still yeah we've still got people here so okay. um but you we, I think um so I was just saying how the COVID long hauler, the autonomic dysfunction, yeah. I think is going to inform how we understand some of the symptoms in, in chronic Lyme patients that inform, mm -hmm. especially the fatigue and cognitive symptoms, because if your blood pressure and pulse and, and blood flow to your brain aren't being regulated properly, which is what the autonomic nervous system does, it's going to have real consequences. And so on a practical level, we often look at that in blood pressure and pulse responses in our patients. And that can be done either just simply in the office or through more sophisticated tests called tilt table tests. And if they have this evidence of autonomic dysfunction, then there's specific treatments for that, both drugs, but also simple things like increasing salt and fluid levels through aggressive hydration to raise blood pressure and mm -hmm. lower pulse. 
results. So that has a very practical implication and, and one that we're, we're really learning more about. And I, and I think we're, you know, we're gonna learn hopefully the mechanisms of what it is about these infections that triggers that autonomic dysfunction. And, and do you kind of see the amount of research that's now being, or, or funding, I suppose, that's being allocated to research of long COVID as, you know, something positive for those in the kind of ME, CFS, you know, um, chronic Lyme disease area, because the more we can understand about kind of post-viral, you know, post-infectious or even long-term infectious, um, diseases, the better. You know, do, do you guys see that as a positive too? Mark? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, no doubt about that. The, uh, it, you know, this, that what's going on, the studies that are going on now about COVID and, you know, the different outcomes and the long-term effects of people who recover from COVID, uh, you know, we're going to learn so much. Uh, you know, I don't think there's any infectious disease that has been studied this fast, this quickly in this depth, you know, uh, and, and that information is going to inform us um, in, in our studies on Lyme disease. You know, it already has, um, you know, uh, I don't know if this has been published, but I had a colleague who came and gave a talk a couple weeks ago and they were studying uh, people with uh, uh, you know, extreme symptoms of, of, of COVID and identified some in, immune dysfunctions that are occurring in those people in their T cells, uh, especially unusual T cells that were showing up um, in these folks. Uh, indicative uh, that they might be you know, uh, a type of T cell that's constantly being stimulated uh, just to a point of, they call it immune exhaustion. And, uh, and that, you know, can cause, you know, symptoms that, that should go away to not go away. And, and uh, we just completed an analysis of, of, of our immune cell subsets and our patients with persistent symptoms. And some of the patients, not all of them, just some of them, you know, have some of these kinds of immune cells in them. So, you know, so I you never would have thought to look at this until I, these, I was informed by that. And I think there's going to be just more and more and more of that happening. Okay. So, so although as, as challenging as COVID is, I mean, we're going to learn an awful lot, mm. you know, um, so. Fab, well, I, I can see lots of questions coming in. Um, sure. So I want to get to those, if that's okay. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so Lynn asked, um, how do we get CCL19 measurement and PP mm. imaging into standard care for patients with Lyme symptoms? And then she added um, to um, John that she really um, should thank you for your piece in The Lancet. She loved seeing that. So, <laughs> so that, that aspect of, you know, bridging then the, you know, first there's the bridge of the human to the biology and research, and then there's the bridge of the research to commercially available tests. That's that's a longer bridge, it turns out, and I'm not obviously one that Mark and I trained to do, but we are engaged in, in commercialization um, uh, co uh, collaborations with companies that would be the ones to take these tests into into commercial, you know, orderable tests for a physician. That's a longer bridge, and so right mm -hmm. now those are not commercially orderable, but we're working on it. It's 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 a whole nother um, set of issues. Um, so mm -hmm. the progress in that's you know longer, measured in years. Mm -hmm. um, but we're working on it. That came to the table. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 Um, There's a lot of work being done now on studying immune signatures in different forms of Lyme disease and seeing whether those signatures can be used in um, diagnoses. So there's a lot of action going on in both academia and, the, and in the private sector. Good to know. Um, so another question here was asked, um, is your research based solely on Lyme sufferers in the US and do strains differ from you know, the, those found in Europe? So I imagine you know, the biobank that you guys are using are gonna be from 
US patients. And right. but yeah, I'll, I'll let you guys. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, you're right. You know, we have filled our freezers up with samples from patients from the Mid Atlantic, uh, Maryland, Virginia, Southern Pennsylvania is the vast majority, and that probably is a um, um, uh, you know a uh, a slice of the whole, whole story because we know that the strains that drive uh, Lyme disease in Europe and the strains that drive Lyme disease in North America are different. Um, they have, you know, they're different kinds of bacteria. And this has been studied by a number of people. Um, uh, uh, Frank Stiro in Slovenia is one person who has done this with his son, Clement. And uh, they have shown that strains from Europe tend to drive a more neurologically based, in just in general, this yeah, is sure. in general, yeah, uh, a more is. neurologically based disease, while the strains in the United States uh, tend to drive a more musculoskeletal disease. But more and when people have had the, uh, the, the opportunity to actually recover those bacteria and grow them and study them uh, in, in the laboratory, they evoke different kinds of responses from immune cells, you know, and uh, um, and that, that I think is just the tip of the iceberg because we know that there's variations in the North American strains. That the strains that are driving disease, say in in the hot spots in New England, are probably are different than in the Midwest and are different than in say the Mid Atlantic or New York. So there's a, a whole st um, uh, uh, studies. Uh, a whole new set of studies that are being done trying to understand the genetic complexity of Borrelia burgdorferi and how it evolved. Borrelia has been around a long time. Um, you know, that's actually, there are some interesting uh, writings from the uh, early British colonists who talked about, uh, you know, persistent symptoms, especially in the summer months and aches and pains that they had. So, <laughs> I think especially in the forests. I guess it's not to say that your findings can't, um, you know, apply over in Europe or, or certainly um, kind of help research move forward over here as well. But I mm -hmm. think that, that's why the charity, you know, called Orlando was always keen to fund research in the UK on, you know, UK Lyme patients for, for mm -hmm. that kind of reason. Um, you know, just to make sure that they, that, that the, you know, the diagnosis and treatments that are developed are going to be you know, as effective as usual, but that's not to say that research that's happening across the pond can't be oh, no. useful in informing yeah. you know, research mm -hmm. over, um, yeah. over Europe. Yeah, yeah. there are more similarities have. and differences, I would say. Yeah. Pardon me? Johnny, There's more know. similarities and differences. Yeah. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Fab, um, next question. Uh, uh, are you guys okay to answer a few more questions? Because I know we're coming up oh. to the past, but we've, we've got quite a few in, so let me get through as many as possible. Um, next question was, do different bacteria impact the immune system to different degrees? For example, is Bartonella harder to treat because of how it affects the immune system or because of the actual bacteria? And then they said, hopefully that makes sense. So I think they're saying, is, is it, is it the, the bacteria itself that causes the problem or, or is it how it triggers the immune system response that is the problem? I think that's what they're saying. I'll take the bacteria part, Mark, and then you can take the immune system. So, sure. You know, I think bacteria, you know, from different, you know, that aren't closely related, in which Bartonella and Borrelia, you know, Borrelia is a very, you know, unusual bacteria and Bartonella is too. So distantly related bacteria have often very different um, antibiotic profiles. Um, and so there is a huge difference in terms of um, non-related bacteria in terms of what the the actual um, treatment profiles are, and you know, Babesia, which isn't even a bacteria, right, has totally different treatment uh, requirements. So, on the microbial side, there are huge differences when you get these wildly unrelated species involved and in transmitted potentially by the same tick, right? So, any of those organisms can be transmitted by the the same tick vector that transmits the disease. So you have to know as a clinician what you're treating because the treatment for Babesia is very different than the treatment for Bartonella, very different than the treatment for Borrelia burgdorferi. Anything to add to, to well, that? Except that, you know, the immune, you know, we, we know very little about how co-infections impact immune responses. 
Um, you know, I think that's an important area of investigation that that that's now being explored. Um, and it's so important because John said, you know, many of these things can be transmitted together uh, and not just other bacteria, but viruses and protozoans um, like, you know, uh, Babesia, as someone has mentioned. And so, um, you know, it's a complicated issue. Um, I think John is fair to say in the Mid-Atlantic, you know, we don't see a lot of co-infections, but um, in New England, they do. And uh, does this, you know, uh, explain some of the differences in symptoms or severity? You know, I think it's, it's, it, it is a real possibility, but something that we need to explore further. Okay, thank you both. Um, next question. Have the panelists found instances where statins exacerbate Lyme? Hmm. So statins, you know, like are the anti-cholesterol drugs that are <clears throat> very commonly prescribed. You know, one of their main side effects are muscle aches and pains. And so I think, you know, people that already have muscle aches and pains from their Lyme disease, you know, I usually am very cautious to have people then add a statin on top of that. <clears throat> but you have to always weigh risk and benefit, right? If the benefit of the statin is huge, then you probably could cautiously do it. If the benefit of the statin is small, then you really have to think, is it worth taking a statin where the side effect profile overlaps with prominent symptoms in that particular mm -hmm. patient, primarily muscular symptoms? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, one of these is probably a bit of a broad question to ask, but um, is there anything that we can do to help reduce inflammation and post-Lyme symptoms? Mark. <laughs> we touched on it, doctor. We touched on it. Well, I think that, you know, what can we do? I mean, um, you know, I think in the theoretical realm, you know, maybe modulating the immune system in subtle ways, you know, can do that. Um, you know, uh, John, John alluded to things that can be done in kind of the mind-body kind of approach. Uh, you know, and, and if these answers aren't satisfying, there's a reason, because I don't think we're there in our knowledge base. Uh, and, um, and it's, I think, uh, it's frustrating for patients. Uh, and I think it's frustrating for clinicians as well. And, uh, but, you know, uh, I, I think that we're, we're getting there. I mean, one of the things that I like to say is that we're starting to identify what the dots are, you know, the metabolome in some people, the microbiome in some people, immune dysfunction in some people. Now we're, now we're trying to connect them. Mm -hmm. Now we're trying to connect them in a holistic manner so that we can, you know, uh, really trying to help people. But the fact that we know that there's underlying biology there um, means that that biology can, uh, can be, uh, can be changed. Because uh, we know that we have small molecules, and new drugs that are coming out. Uh, we're exploring with some people the, pa the possibility that we can repurpose drugs, you know, based upon some of the molecular changes we know that are occurring in patients. You know, can drugs that we already know about that are safe, you know, can be applied that we didn't even know that they could be used in this case. And drug repurposing is, is, uh, is, is happening in many, in many spheres, and we're involved in that too. So... There are some specific things people can do today that I can mention that have some science okay. behind them. Yeah. You know, there's no there's no magic cure all. So I would I would avoid people kind of saying that this is a silver bullet. But there are some things that there's some science behind. Vitamin D is probably the biggest one. Oh. I mean, there's mm -hmm. tons of research behind vitamin D and illnesses like multiple sclerosis and others where vitamin maintaining a normal uh, vitamin D level, which almost none of my patients have when they start. Mm -hmm is really important for your immune system and inflammation. There's some evidence behind turmeric as well, uh, the, you know, the um, seasoning turmeric mm -hmm. as an anti-inflammatory that's, that's real, you know, uh, papers that I can point to that suggest that it could have an anti-inflammatory effect. Um, Omega-3 fatty acids, there's some information on. So I think there are some specific things where there actually is some primitive, but real science behind it. And it doesn't mean that things where there isn't science couldn't be good. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it's hard to know. But there are some where there is science. And vitamin mm -hmm. D is the one I would really point out is almost nobody has a normal vitamin D level in my clinic when they come to me. Thank you. No, they're good examples. 
Mm -hmm. um, next one, someone asks, is it possible for Lyme to lie dormant with mild to manageable symptoms like you described, such as fatigue, uh, brain fog and gut problems, and then become ac activated when infected with COVID? In other words, is there evidence that Lyme disease could be responsible for long, long COVID? Mm. You know, we, that's a clearly we don't know, but I, I will say, at least in the United States, that the big clinics that care for lots of, you know, chronic Lyme patients have, have not reported, and to my knowledge at least, huge problems with COVID in their patients. Um, so you would think it might, and it still may, but it's not, it hasn't spiked up, in, at least in what I've been hearing. Um, and uh, so I, I think maybe it's not going to be as big a problem, although my patients often have exacerbation of their symptoms with other things in their life, you know, that like other infections. So I, it can happen, but I'm not sure it's happened to the extent I was worried about it, that it would with COVID. Um, but, you know, the, it would be hard to answer that question definitively now. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are actually engaging in studies you know, we have a big biobank of blood samples for our patients, and we're, we're actually just started our first collaboration with COVID researchers, where we're going to be comparing our blood samples from our, um, our chronic Lyme, persistent Lyme patients to the COVID long haulers blood samples side by side. So we mm -hmm. are actually starting studies to kind of answer those questions. Yeah, so I guess I guess, and I know that a lot of Lyme patients are concerned about getting on COVID or getting the vaccine or being immune, yeah. um, you know, compromised. And, and I apologize to me. I know there's been a few questions about vaccine, vaccines and asking for your opinions, but I'm a, I'm a little bit hesitant to ask about that because we, we discussed it in a previous event and it was a little bit co controversial. So apologies, I'm not ignoring anybody. It's just something I, I feel is very difficult to answer and a little bit controversial. Um, so someone mentioned here, they just linked to kind of long COVID about apparently Dr. Tina Pierce uh, says a study will be published soon by a university hospital in the UK, proving the link between MCAS, so I think that's mast cell activation syndrome and long COVID. And this person was saying how mast cell activation, activation syndrome was their, is their worst Lyme symptom and that it's quite hmm. badly understood in the UK. I don't know how it's kind of viewed over in the US or... I mean, there are, are, are some people that have a special interest in mast cell activation syndrome. So I think that's, you know, probably another subgroup of people where that may be one of the more prominent things driving their symptoms. Mm -hmm. Let me just see if we've just maybe got time for one or two more questions. Let me just see what's coming on. You know, someone here mentioning that COVID, they felt that COVID made their lie much worse, uh, their symptoms. Mm. And, and someone just thank you for noting those uh, supplements that you mentioned, John. Um, so uh, the question here, do, do the specific bacteria mentioned in the gut, one too high, one too low, be influenced positively through diet or probiotics? So I, know, I, th I, think, mm -hmm. I think they're asking whether probiotics can... Um, you know, positively manage, you know, back to any bacteria kind of issues in the gut, I think is essentially what they're asking. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 go ahead, Mark. No, go, you, you got it, John. Yeah, I mean, there, there's better data on that actually for C. diff colitis as clostridium difficile bacteria that mm -hmm. cause the diarrhea there. You know, it's very hard to treat with antibiotics and sometimes people respond to probiotics. They also respond to fecal transplants, right? Yeah. Where you actually transplant the microbiome with somebody else's fecal microbiome. And so that's evidence that you can impact positively the microbiome by introducing new bacteria. And mm -hmm. so um, it, it's not outrageous to think that, you know, that you could impact it through my probiotics. Um, although I don't think that there's just, you know, randomized controlled trials on that yet. Yeah, uh, I mean, the, it's, you know, the fact that we found this unusual bacteria, Blaudia, you know, that, that sort of off kilter is really got us scratching our heads because we don't know a lot about that and how that impacts health and health and, uh, and human disease. 
Uh, back to Roy days, we have a sense, you know, because, gee, that's this GABA producing thing. Oh, my goodness. You know, but back to Blaudia, you know, it makes us wonder. But the two are mutually exclusive. You know, people who have high Blaudia have low Bacteroides. And if you have high Bacteroides, you have low Blaudia. So it's, it's pretty clear there's a, a, a really clear correlation. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a puzzle. But... It's what we think about when we wake up at four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> no, I'm true. It's what we do. We're like, oh, well, what's this mean? <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much, Bo, for your time. Um, I apologize to anyone that I didn't uh, get to kind of ask through the question, but as a big thank you to you. And, and as someone said in the chat, you know, it's been really fascinating talking to you and just having that breakdown and, and understanding those um you know the, those discoveries that you're making but also and like they've said most most importantly you know you've been able to give that positive spin you've been able to kind of be straight with us tell us what what you know what the limitations are but but what you do know and and how that is you know really moving in the right direction um and i think that's you know a really you know, like I say, really positive and kind of affirming stuff for us to be talking about and sharing um, you know, and our, our charity's research program starts this year, uh, you know, we'll be giving our first grants in the spring and hopefully we'll be able to do, um, you know, make some research happen that's, you know, as interesting and impactful a, a, as you guys. Um, I can see uh, somebody was making a, a comment about whether we'll circulate a summary. So the event today is being recorded. So um, everyone who's registered will receive an email tomorrow with a recording. And if um, John's happy to, he'll share that figure that he um, popped up on the screen. I can include that in the email. So um, mm. anyone that would like to have a bit more time looking at it can do so. Um, but yes, we've got people here just saying thank you very much, guys, and, you know, wishing you all the very best with your research. Again, I really appreciate you giving um, time today and extra time because we've done an extra 15 minutes. Oh, that's oh, fine. Uh, thank you very much. And, you know, thank you for your foundation, for the support and for the invitation. And thank you that you're going to be supporting Lyme disease research in, uh, in, uh, in yeah. Great Britain. That's fantastic. Yeah, we're really excited. Um but yeah, it's just it, let's say it's been really interesting to hear you both. I really appreciate you both giving us uh, giving us your time, and we appreciate all the work that you're doing across the pond. Mm -hmm. And everyone is just saying, you know, brilliant, and thank you very much. So, so okay. everyone have a great evening, and you guys have a good afternoon. We will. Thank you. Good to be with okay. you. Bye, and happy St. Patrick's Day to everybody. <laughs> yes, <happy St. Patrick's laughs> I don't know if you celebrate it, but I do. <laughs> we do. We do. We I got do. my green on. So. <laughs> all right. Take care. Okay. Thanks, bye bye. Everyone. Bye bye. Bye.